This video is going over my recovery from binge eating disorder. Now, I am not a healthcare professional in any way, shape, or form. I have not been trained in the intricacies and complexities of helping other people recover from eating disorders of any kind. I am going to continue with my story, but please always remember that it's just that, my story. Don't take it as advice, just take it as a friend sitting down and talking with another friend and letting you know that you are not alone. I understand this struggle, oh my gosh, more than most people know, and I have so much empathy and compassion for you wherever you are in this journey. Now first, I just wanna define what I am talking about when I say binge eating disorder. I am going to read a definition, a summarized definition off of the nationaleatingdisorder.org website, and then also leave a link in the description box below that will take you directly to the diagnostic criteria for this eating disorder. It's really important that you understand what it is. We need to be talking about the same thing in this video. Binge eating disorder, or BED, is a severe, life-threatening, and treatable eating disorder characterized by recurrent episodes of eating large quantities of food, a feeling of a loss of control during the binge, experiencing shame, distress, or guilt afterward, and not regularly using unhealthy, compensatory measures like purging or exercising to counter the binge eating. It is the most common eating disorder in the United States. Now, if you are new here, this is not the first video I'm making on this topic. I am going to have a playlist on my channel page of all the videos I have made sharing about it. But there's one in particular where I had claimed that I was delivered from my binge eating disorder by God. And I believed that. I said it in faith and the evidence, the anecdotal evidence I had was that I had not struggled for a long period of time, maybe four to six months, the longest period in my life that I didn't have the compulsion to binge eat. And that was true and that was real. Unfortunately, shortly after I made that video, I fell into the binging patterns again. And as you can imagine, that was unbelievably mortifying. One, because I made a video saying that I was free from it, but more so because I was struggling again. And binge eating disorder has been, hands down, the biggest struggle of my entire life. You can definitely go watch that video if you wanna hear more about my upbringing and my background and what I was experiencing in that season of my life four years ago, but I will just summarize it here by saying that my earliest memories of eating a ton of food at once to make myself feel better was at four years old. It's literally the first memory that I can recall. And from that period until I was in my late 20s, 26 years old, I struggled intensely not to eat humongous portions of food discreetly by myself to self-medicate. Um, I went through periods of binging and possibly starving. It didn't fall under the category of anorexia. I have looked into that before. Um, but I was a dieter and a binger and I experienced that my whole life. I did not realize what the definition of that problem was until I was 18. It was part of a spiritual experience that I encountered. And then I spent the next eight years trying to recover from it. Now the outline of this video is going to be me sharing with you the specific steps that I took to recover from this eating disorder. Now many of them didn't get me to recovery at the end, which was extremely disheartening in a eating disorder that constantly just makes you feel incredible amounts of shame. I would try and I would try and I would try and I would fail and I would fail and I would fail and I would binge and I would binge and I would binge and I tear up thinking about it because, holy shit guys, it is the most painful and most difficult trial I have ever experienced in my life. And when I say trial, I mean it was my life. There was no end. I was constantly falling back into food and feeling an unbelievable amount of shame for it and nobody in my immediate circle understood or saw. And that's really hard. Um, so let me be a source of solidarity to you if you feel that same way. I understand and I see and there is hope, I promise you, there is hope. 
Oh boy, I wasn't planning on crying in this video. Let's move on. Okay. So one last thing before I get into this list. All of these things helped me in my recovery, even if they didn't help me directly. Just the fact that I was moving, that I was doing something, that I hadn't lost hope was a step toward recovery. And I have to reiterate that to those of you who are struggling in this way or know somebody who is struggling in this way because it is a very tumultuous struggle and you're constantly filled with feelings of hopelessness. So every single step you are taking at attempting to heal is healing you even if you don't see it. Now the first thing that I went headstrong, headfirst into was research about diet and nutrition. I am not necessarily talking about diet for weight loss, though I would be lying if I said I didn't care about that. I don't know how you can live in the world that we live in and not think as a woman that your body isn't right. So I definitely had a dose of that. But I was more interested, the end goal was just being in recovery, not feeling so hopeless and shameful about my eating habits. I thought that if I ate the right diet, the right balanced macronutrient profile and micronutrient profile, that that would cure my binge eating disorder. I think that this is a huge step for people who struggle with food in any way. It is really important that we understand the glycemic index and how protein, carbohydrates, and fats operate in our body. Unfortunately, there's a whole belief system tied to the food that we eat and food is a moral. There is no good or bad food. So there is this paradox that there's no such thing as bad food, but it's also extremely important that we feed ourselves well, a balanced diet in which our body is going to work optimally. And ultimately, what it came down to was that it didn't matter what kind of diet I was eating, whether it was completely clean, whether it was Whole30 or vegan or Mediterranean, I could probably make one whole video that would be 20 minutes long about all the different diets I tried for committed periods of time. It didn't matter, I still binged. Having a well-researched understanding of nutrition and how it works in your body is extremely important, but it is not the answer for healing from binge eating disorder. The next thing I tried was therapy. Now, my first experiences in therapy were with church-based therapists. This aligned with what I thought my problem was, which was a spiritual problem more than anything else. Just going to therapy was a huge step for me. If you haven't been in therapy before, I don't know what your thoughts are surrounding it, but I was just desperate, but I was also kind of mortified to be going into therapy because I couldn't figure out my own stuff and I really wanted to be able to figure out stuff on my own. But my track record for that wasn't great and I kept binging, so in desperation, I pursued church-based therapy. It was what I could afford, ultimately, was why I went to church-based therapy. Um, I saw three different therapists and they were all very kind. At least one of them, I am certain, actually used research-based practices to try to sort through what I was going through, identify different coping mechanisms that would help me um, deal with stress rather than go to food, and different things of that nature. None of these therapists fixed me, uh, but I did a whole lot of really hard, painful work. When I was in those therapies, I never noticed a difference. I definitely didn't notice a difference in my binge eating. Um, and the differences I noticed in my life were actually worse for a while. And I think that that is pretty normal for when you're going into therapy for the first time because you're really starting to deconstruct parts of your mindsets that are wrong, ultimately, that are weak and that are hurting you. And when you do that, when you deconstruct anything, you're taking it apart, you're breaking it, and that's extremely painful. But even though therapy in those years that I was in Florida trying to pursue it and didn't heal, even though it didn't work, it didn't fix me, I cannot recommend it enough. You gotta be in therapy for a while and you gotta work through your stuff forever in order to heal. There is recovery in sight, but if, you're don't, if you don't see it and you don't see the clear path to it, 
keep doing the work because little changes are being made that are healing you. I guarantee it. If you keep showing up, you're healing. I promise, I promise, keep showing up because you are healing. The next thing that I did was that I shared with my family and friends face to face. I was talking to people when I was actually in front of them, not just like online through messages and such, but in the scary confines of a room where your heart is pounding and you're not sure how you're going to be received, I talked about my struggles with the people who knew me. I did this a lot. I, w I shared very openly with people who I loved and who loved me. Unfortunately, binge eating disorder is not understood at all. It's not even that it's misunderstood. People don't really understand it, and especially if you're not heavily overweight, they almost don't believe you. And that kind of was my experience sharing with my family and friends who are wonderful people um, and love me the best that they know how. Oh boy, I think it's really important to share your struggles openly with the people that you do life with. Even just to put yourself out there and say, this is me, do you see me? If the answer is no, which it almost always was when I sh shared my struggle, at least I was putting myself out there. It hurt every single time I would share and people didn't listen or people didn't understand or people didn't care to understand further. So if you are watching this because you know somebody who struggles with it, can I beg you to do a little research to look into exactly what this eating disorder is and exactly what it does to tear apart the self-worth and the self-confidence of the person that's struggling with it. <sighs> God dang it. Because there is no lonelier feeling. <sighs> than fighting for your life, sharing it with someone you love and they either don't know and don't care to know or just don't see you at all and then move on as if nothing ever happened. Do research, both if you struggle with this or if you know someone who struggles with it because your source of accurate information is not going to come from the person who struggles with it. They are trying to figure it out their best already. Look to research online, look through psychology forums, look for researchers and experts in the field, read the books that they have to say about it. We can't do this alone. People who struggle with this eating disorder are alone already. They are marginalized and they feel an overwhelming amount of shame. They don't feel confident in their ability to even explain what they're struggling with. Help your family or friend out by caring more and pushing through the discomfort and the pain and honestly the boredom. It's not like this is a fun thing to research, but if you do that, I promise you it's going to make a massive difference in the person who's struggling with it, understanding that they are worthy of your time and that they're allowed, their pain is allowed to take up space in this world and you wanna be there for them and help them however you can. Lord have mercy, I went so far off the script right there, but I am not cutting this out because it's so true and no one's talking about it. Now the way that I leaned in the most to try to find healing and recovery from my binge eating disorder was through church and quiet times and prayer and scripture study and reading. I believed that my issue was more than anything a spiritual problem that my God could fix. Now at the time, seeing it as a spiritual problem really meshed with my belief system. I was extremely devout in my evangelical Christian faith, and I have shared here before a lot about that, and I know that it encouraged many of you. Um, unfortunately, when you see a spiritual problem in yourself, and you're identifying it as a spiritual problem, it makes sense because you are a sinful human being and you constantly are trying to fix yourself. That's what we do as humans. We try to be better. 
And if we're doing that on our own, we believe that we're not going to get anywhere. It's essentially a fruitless pursuit because God is the ultimate healer. The more I leaned into my faith and seeing my eating disorder as something that God could fix, the harder my eating disorder became. At the peak of my binge eating disorder shortly before I stepped into a place of consistently not feeling the compulsion to binge, um, it was the strongest I had ever been in my faith. I was leaning heavier than I ever had in my entire life into my relationship with my God. And it was sincere. It was to know Him and it was to love Him. And it was just for that. I loved him with my body, my mind, my soul, my spirit, every ounce of me, every part of my identity was to know God and to make him known. When I leaned into my relationship with God more than I ever had in my life, and I've always leaned into it real hard, and I also saw a correlation with my binge eating disorder getting harder and more painful than it had ever been before, to say I had a crisis of faith would be putting it extremely lightly. I promise I will fill you in more on the faith side of things in the future. But for now, I'm just going to say that I had to identify that my binge eating disorder was so much more than just a spiritual problem. And treating it as primarily a spiritual problem made it worse because it made me feel more shame about who I was. It made me feel like, worse of a sinner and worse of a person. And that kind of shame is, in research, positively correlated with only self-harming and other harming behavior. I know that was a lot, and I promise I will get into it more in the future, but that's all I'm gonna say for now. Now the last big thing that I tried, and I'm so happy that I tried it, even though it didn't fully help me recover, were recovery programs, and specifically Food Addicts and Recovery Anonymous. I was also living in Florida when I discovered this program. It was right around the time I was having this extreme crisis of faith and just feeling very hopeless and very broken, and I had been actively doing all of these things that I had mentioned previously to heal and recover, yet it was getting worse. And so I went to this program, and it was, for the first time in my life, a place where I saw other people who also struggled with food in various ways, even if they didn't experience binge eating disorder. Now you know, based on how much I was crying previously, how important it was to me and how much value I gained in being in rooms where people actually saw me, saw my struggle, and understood it to a degree. It was amazing. And I was a part of that program for about six months. It was the Marine Corps of 12-step programs. You are on a specific eating plan. You do not veer from that eating plan for anything. There's no sugar, no flour, uh, no packaged or boxed foods in any way, shape, or form. You can't smoke. You can't drink. You don't date if you're not in a committed marital relationship. You do the 12 steps, which many people in 12-step programs do, which is a rigorous and painful inventory of your inner self. You put it out there. You have to apologize to people who you have wronged. It's a very humbling and sometimes humiliating process. However, it was wonderful. It was so wonderful for so long. And it was around the period that I was in that program that I made that previous video where I said that I was healed, that I had been delivered from binge eating disorder or food addiction, as what I called it previously. That program was so important to me because it was the first time in my life I had seen life without binge eating disorder clouding everything. I was doing emotional work I wasn't capable of doing because I was constantly falling into binging when things got painful. So it, therapy was happening naturally, even though I was also seeing a therapist, and I was getting into these deep recesses of my soul. I was bringing up traumatic experiences I had had in my past, and I was able to sort through them because I had accountability that saw me 
and was holding me up in those painful times where I couldn't handle the stress, I could share my stress with them and they listened. Even if they didn't have advice or an answer, they were there and they saw me and they did the work with me. And that was life altering. It was absolutely amazing. I didn't love everything about the program. Primarily, I really wanted my church body to be my accountability, who I shared life with, who saw me and who was willing to carry my pain and my struggle and, and just see me, even if they weren't helping me as much as they thought they could or as much as I thought they could. So I left that program and did the best to create accountability in my life the same way that they had been doing it with my closest friends and my church family. Now, shortly after I left that program is when I had made that video that I had mentioned, um, talking about how I had been set free from food addiction and gotten very involved in other things that I thought would also help me recover. Um, ultimately, I did fall back into the binge eating disorder. Now, from the time my daughter was two until I had my youngest daughter two years later, I still continued to battle and fall back into the binge eating disorder. And usually it got worse and worse every time. Now that I've spent what feels like 45 minutes explaining all of the things that I've tried, I almost feel like this is gonna be really anticlimactic. But the single greatest choice I made in my recovery was choosing to believe that I was not a bad person. Choosing to believe that I was not a failure and a screw up. Choosing to believe that there was good in me. I didn't have to attribute the good things that I did to somebody else outside of me. I eventually chose to look inward and give myself a sense of self-worth and a sense of belonging. I did not love myself and the culture that I was surrounded by did not teach a message that taught me how to love myself. It taught me how to love someone else and be thankful to that someone else to love me. I realize this sounds like a coming out video and that's not what it is. Hmm. The single most effective step I've ever taken in healing is committing to fostering a sense of self-worth, self-acceptance, and self-love and who I am because I say so. <laughs> I am good enough. I am good enough for this world. I am allowed to take up space when somebody wrongs me. I am allowed to say no when my body says no. I am allowed to say stop if I don't want to be touched. I am allowed to share the things that I create with the world. I am allowed to feel shame and anger and disappointment in who I am, and I'm allowed to open up and make space for that and to let it be there without judging myself. And you know what happens? Shame turns into guilt. And it's very important that these two things are differentiated because shame is positively correlated to only self-harming and others harming behavior. Guilt is positively correlated only to self-beneficial and other beneficial behaviors. What guilt does is it brings people together. It makes people want to apologize for something they did. Shame makes people want to apologize I don't apologize for who I am anymore to anyone. And I apologize a lot more often to people for what I've done. Because when you struggle with mental illness, you hurt a lot of people. <laughs> you hurt a lot of people when you don't know how to take care of yourself. But when you start taking steps toward loving and caring for your own self and giving yourself room to make mistakes and not tearing yourself apart when you make them, the world changes and it changes dramatically. I think I've said enough for today. 
I hope if you struggle in this way or know somebody who struggles that you have been able to make sense of all the stuff I've said because I know it was a lot. Um, be encouraged and thank you for letting me share. Um, I know I'm gonna lose a lot of you in this video, but honestly, I... <sighs> what can I say to that? If I'm being authentic to who I am and I'm finding healing and strength and recovery, I can't hide it so that I don't disappoint other people. Thank you all for coming to my TED Talk and listening to my story. If it helps you or you know somebody it could help, will you share it? Because I believe with all my heart that this is a piece of healing that people need to hear. It helped me more than anything else, and I don't want to keep it in anymore. Now, I guarantee you I'm going to have the most dramatic vulnerability hangover I've ever had in my whole life, which doesn't mean I'm going to go drink. It just means tomorrow I'm going to wake up and feel mortified that I just exposed my whole entire naked emotional body to the world, and what in the world was I thinking? I guarantee you that's going to happen. So I might not be around on social media for a few days because I'm going to go write to my therapist and tell her all the uncomfortable things I'm feeling. You should go to therapy if you don't. It's a wonderful thing. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.